Good afternoon. All right. Um, so I've been really inspired so far today. And uh, now is sort of like the roll up your sleeves session. We're going to talk about execution and pushing ideas forward. Um, for the past uh, six years or so, I've been obsessed with helping creative people and creative teams actually create something. And I've been inspired by the frustration that uh, this is oftentimes so difficult. And the fact that, uh, and the sad truth, that most ideas never happen. Even the greatest ideas suffer horrible odds. And, um, and I'm sure that uh, you know, it would be a great thing and the world would be a wonderful place if there was such thing as idea meritocracy, where somehow, some way, the best ideas had the best chance of actually seeing the light of day. And of course, that's not true. So uh, I wanna talk a little bit first about why that is. So first of all, when a new idea strikes, energy and excitement is extremely high. Whether it's for a project that you're involved in, something that you really care deeply about and that you're passionate about, and you come up with some idea or realization or solution, and then you're up till three in the morning working on something, you get people together, you're motivated, you're excited, you're not doing other things, you know, you're just focused on that. This is when a lot of people leave their full-time job to start writing that novel that they always wanted to write, and they start writing that first chapter. And then, uh, as time passes, energy starts to dwindle down. You start to fall behind on those television shows you love watching. You start to fall behind on life. And you realize you've sort of entered this project plateau. This, you know, the doldrums of project management. A very unhappy place to be. And as creative people who love what we do, what we desperately want to do is return to that level of energy and excitement that accompanied the idea itself. And so what do we do? we just come up with another idea. <laughs> and then we come up with another idea. And ideas lead to ideas lead to ideas. And this is why there are more half-written novels in the world than there are novels. It's because we always do this. We're guilty. Now, what, of course, what we want to do is push one idea to completion. You know, and that's what I want to talk a little bit about today. Um, so this is one of the things we're up against, this love for idea generation, or I call it idea-to-idea -idea syndrome that a lot of us have as idealists. Um, the other thing that we're up against is the gravitational force of operations. You know, the day-to-day -day stuff that always pulls us away from that exciting idea that we came up with last night, you know, or yesterday. Or we have a great meeting and then we get back and we realize we're overwhelmed with email and other stuff we have to do, chores and everything else. So we're up against that as well. We're up against feeling organized, or lack of feeling organized for that matter. When we uh, interview you know, thousands and thousands of creative individuals and teams and ask them how organized they feel they are, you can see you know, the majority of people, only 7% say they feel very organized. Double that number, 14%, say they live a life of quote unquote utter chaos. So you know, we're up against something there. A lack of accountability. You have an idea, you don't tell anyone, no one holds you accountable to it, it's unlikely to happen. Um, a lack of leadership capability. You know how many great creative teams, great bands come together, great projects, great people come together, and then they disband. You know, they, come, they, they break apart before the project's done. And it's oftentimes because they didn't like the way it was led. They didn't respect the leader, the manager. This is why there's such an attrition issue in the creative world. People just don't stick together long enough to make stuff happen. It comes back to a leadership problem. A lack of feedback exchange. How many, I'm sure we've all had someone we know and love who had a great idea or, or not a good idea, but they, they have f they are, their flaws and what they want to do, but we don't want to break the news to them because they're so excited about it. We don't want to kind of pop their bubble. And that's a problem, right? We're hurting them because they need, the, they need the feedback in order to make this actually happen. So that's another thing we're up against. Disorganized and isolated networks, um, a lack of attribution and transparency. It's very hard to know who's really doing what, who's responsible for what. Credit is lacking in the creative world. Online these days, you see a really cool picture. You never even know who took it. So these are all the sorts of things that we're up against in terms of giving people the opportunity uh, to end the wind at their back in, in making ideas actually happen. So our team at Behance has been focused on this for years, developing all sorts of tools and technology. And, and uh, we like to say that we're medium-centric and mission or, sorry, mission-centric and medium agnostic, meaning we're all about organizing creative people and we don't care how we'll do it through technology, through talking about it, through research, that sort of thing. And so what I want to do today is talk about how some people and teams consistently defy the odds in making their ideas happen, whereas most of us don't. And I want to share some things that we need to think about. And this is sort of the roll up your sleeves, getting your hands dirty part. This is about 
how you actually push the idea that you're thinking of to fruition. Some things we need to keep in mind. And um, a lot of people will ask me sometimes, oh, that's, I didn't come together. Um, uh, so making ideas happen is really all about the organization and uh, how sort of you stay organized on a daily basis. It's about how you leverage your community, the people around you to refine your ideas and hold you accountable to them um, and collaborate with you. And then of course, it's the leadership itself. It's sort of how do you keep the team together or how do you keep yourself on track to make an idea actually happen. And so I wanna start with a problem that all of us face, and probably right now we're all facing this problem, is, which is we're being inundated with stuff. Right now, right? You're getting text messages, voicemail messages, email messages, Twitter messages, Facebook messages, and the list goes on. The sad reality is that this modern era that we're, you know, at modern age, we are s sort of entering the, the, uh, the state of reactionary workflow. We're simply reacting to everything that's coming into us, pecking away at the collective inboxes every second, instead of being proactive with our energy and what matters most to us. And so we could all literally go through every day simply reacting and never being proactive at all. And I was talking to a guy the other day who drives into work, has like a morning commute. And it's during that time where he was telling me he would think about you know, his life and what he wants to do with his career and sort of long-term thinking. It was the sacred space that he relied on every day. And then he told me that recently he got a new uh, car with an iPhone integration. And now he has like thousands of songs at his fingertips. He has Twitter on his dashboard when he's at a stoplight. And he's lost that sacred space. And I would venture to say that the final frontier of forced deep thinking, where we actually have to sort of unplug and think you know, about our lives, is probably the shower. And we've almost lost that. They have like shower media centers now and stuff like that. Point being is that we need to have windows of non-stimulation in our lives. And a lot of the people that I meet, even social media, you know, CEOs and stuff like that, people who you'd think would be most guilty of this, they save a couple hours every day where they don't react, but rather think about a separate list of two to three things that are most important to them over the long term. And it's during this uninterrupted space where they're thinking, they're, they're digesting an article that they've read and thinking about the application of that to what they want to do in their life and in this world. So it's important that we create those windows for ourselves. I want to also make the case to you, you need to spend energy on how you organize. We also oftentimes you know, focus too much on the next great idea. And we don't focus enough on how we actually organize and execute around those ideas that we already have. And so I'd like to make the case that creativity times organization equals the impact that you will make with your ideas. And if you look at a little math here, you can see what I'm saying. You can have all the greatest ideas and creativity in the world, but if you have zero organization, you're going to make no impact. And then there's a controversial suggestion I'm making, which is maybe if you spend a little less time focusing on that next best idea and a little more time on organizing around it, we'll make more of an impact. There are a lot of examples that I won't go into now, but the point being is that organization is really important, not only for individuals, but also for teams and companies. And there's this uh, great company uh, that is always on the top of the 100 most organized companies of the world list that comes out every year by a supply chain management magazine that I'm sure none of us have ever seen. I haven't seen, I've just heard. But interestingly enough, you'd think, you know, what's the most organized company in the world? FedEx, UPS, Walmart, one of these logistics-driven businesses. Actually, the answer is Apple. Um, a company known for creativity is actually one of the most organized companies in the world. So, we got to organize, and you got to be organized starting by having a bias towards action in your day. Thinking about capturing everything that starts with a verb, everything that you, know, you have to take an action on, and focusing on making sure that everything is captured, that any meeting that you have, if it's not actionable, it shouldn't even be a meeting. You know, going through your day with a lens of everything that's actionable and keeping those things separate from everything else that you've got. All right, action? All right, yeah, okay. <laughs> Anyways, there are a few types of people that I kept meeting along the way in this research. Um, the first was the dreamer. The dreamer is like, you know, always thinking about what we can do next. Maybe we can do this, maybe we can do that. Even a day before the event, they're thinking, maybe we can get this person involved and do this sponsorship. And they're always, that's what keeps them up at night, is what new ideas, what new things we can, we can do. Um, and that's what makes them excited. Then you have the doers. The doers are sort of like the Debbie Downers of the world. The doers are like, no, 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 can't do that, don't have the time, events tomorrow, no, you know, that's the doer mentality. The doer goes to bed happy at night when there are no new ideas in the pipeline. <laughs> All right? 
And then you have the incrementalist who kind of rotates from dreamer mode to doer mode, dreamer mode to doer mode. But regardless of what you identify with, my point is, is that we all need to share ideas liberally. We need to make sure that everyone around us that kind of keeps us accountable, refines, occasionally kills our ideas, knows about them. And a lot of the, one of the biggest mistakes a lot of people make is they keep their ideas to themselves. They're scared of what other people will think. They feel they're not ready yet. They're worried that someone's going to steal their idea. Well, the truth is it's so hard to make an idea happen, you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> the immune system. Some of these teams, individuals that I've met that work you know, in, in groups making projects happen, they have a really strong immune system. And what I mean by that is, you know how your body has an immune system that kills off anything new? And that's why it keeps you healthy. You, you know, every day you, you get viruses or whatever entering your body and you're, they're killed by the immune system. And in great teams, you have a healthy immune system. You have people who are the, the Debbie Downers of the world, the people who keep killing ideas as they come up to keep you on track. Every now and then when you're trying to solve a problem or create something new and you go into that brainstorming mode, that's when you empower the dreamers and you suppress the immune system, you suppress the doers. The equivalent in the body is that if you ever get an organ transplant, the first thing the doctor does is they suppress your immune system so you can take on the new organ. It's the same thing. And so what great leaders do is they build a team that has both the doers and the dreamers. And the problem is that when you're a dreamer, when you're someone who comes up with great ideas and you put together a team, you just want to hire other dreamers. And then it becomes an intoxicated orgy of idea generation <laughs> and nothing gets done. So the point is, is we need sober monitors. We need designated drivers on teams. The people who are not as fun to brainstorm and come up with ideas with, but keep us on track. Let's make sure we keep those people. Let's keep fighting in our teams. There were so many teams that talked to me about the benefit of fighting and how that helped them get to a better solution. You know, and I was perplexed by that. Why would fighting be a good thing? And it was sort of described to me as this like multidimensional tug of war. You know, each person sort of advocating for what they think the answer is. And what the problem is, is when someone sort of in the middle of that fight sort of lets go and says, you know what, I don't care, whatever you think. And that's called apathy, right? And that hurts your customer, that hurts the people you're trying to serve. Because at that moment in time, you're no longer exploring that person's opinion, right? What that person thinks the solution should be. And so great leaders keep people engaged in the fight. That's another thing I think we should think about. Um, I wanna talk about uh, making sure that we all work in the intersection of, of really where our greatest work, where our greatest creations can come out of. And I believe that the intersection is your genuine interest, you know, what you're truly, truly interested in, your skill set or those that you can easily develop, like if you're great at math, you're great at this or great at that, and then the opportunities that exist around you that you could tap. Now, a perfect example of how you're not working in your intersection is say you love, love music, and you live in New Orleans, which is a great opportunity to be in the music industry, except you can't carry a note for the life of you. That is not working in your intersection, but if you've got great business skills, and you are the business manager of a band that you met in New Orleans, then you are working in your intersection. And so what we need to do on our, on our own is find where our intersection is. What's the stuff that when you're reading at night, you keep your eyes open to keep reading because you're so fascinated by it? That's your genuine interest. The other thing we need to keep in mind is that as leaders, we need to push everyone into working in their intersection. So as the leader of any sort of project, you control the opportunity circle because you're the one who's deciding what this person should do. And so make sure you push them into working in an opportunity that overlaps with what they're genuinely interested in and the skills that they either have or could easily develop. Something to think about. The last piece I wanna talk about is just something that I was very struck by um, in my own career after talking to so many different people who had had incredible cre creative career trajectories, had done something remarkable, whether it was in government or nonprofit or in business, and all of them talked about this moment where they suddenly gained confidence from being doubted. And it was interesting, you know, society is very hypocritical. Society shuns what society ends up celebrating. We shun the people that, you know, decide to drop out of college because they want to start this business or whatever, and then the Steve Jobs, the Mark Zuckerbergs, the Bill Gates of the world, we celebrate them later when they change the world as we know it, right? We typically shun things before we celebrate them. 
And I was talking to, for example, a guy who was in a, in a huge publishing conglomerate, a big publishing company, on track to being one of the lead publishers. And they, uh, you know, they, they, they gave him this opportunity like 10 years ago or something to join this small group of three people called digital publishing. And he decided to take that job. And people said, what are you, crazy? Why would anyone ever read a book on a computer? You know, don't throw away your career. And for whatever reason, the more people that started to doubt him, the more confident he became that this was the right thing for him. Which shows us that if everyone thinks you're crazy, you're either crazy <laughs> or you're really onto something. <laughs> and so my point is, is that we all, in our own path, should gain confidence from the doubt that we get along the way. And what we must recognize is that nothing extraordinary is ever achieved through ordinary means. Nothing extraordinary is ever achieved through ordinary means. Thank you.